Hi everyone, my name is Kaylee. I'm sure you'll be very surprised to find out how old I am. What do you think? I bet you guessed wrong. I might look like a 50-year-old woman, but in fact, I'm only 15 years old. That's right, I said 15. What's even weirder is that when I was born, I looked like an 80-year-old. I look this way now because I'm getting younger every year. And it's not just my looks. My health is also like that of an older person. Just like my appearance, my internal organs are old too. But thankfully, they are also getting a little younger day by day. The reason for this is that I have a very rare genetic disorder. They say that only 1 in 20 million people have it. Since the world population is roughly 8 billion, there are at most 400 people who have this condition. However, many people with this condition die young because it comes with many health risks. Like I said earlier, it's not just how we look. Our organs are older too. We are struggling with diseases that people usually develop when they get older. This is why, according to scientists, my making it to age 15 is nothing short of a miracle. And the credit for this goes to my parents who are both doctors. I managed to survive this long thanks to their hard work and advancements in medicine. I think that my life story, which I'm about to share with you, is quite inspiring on many levels. As I just mentioned, both my parents were doctors. They actually started dating when they were in college. But since med school takes a long time, they weren't in a rush to get married. They decided to have a child when they were older because they were so busy with their work. My mom had a normal, full-term pregnancy despite being older. She didn't encounter any problems, that is, until I was born. When everyone saw me, they were shocked because I looked like an 80-year-old. My skin was all wrinkly. I had a couple of white hairs on my head and two teeth that were decayed. Since my voice was very deep, I sounded like an old person when I cried. Instead of screaming and crying like a baby, I was moaning the way old people usually do. Tests showed that my internal organs were also worn out, just like my appearance. My heart wasn't very strong. My bones were too weak. My lungs, kidneys, liver, and all my inner organs were in really bad shape, as if they'd been used for many years. Since this was such a rare disorder, at first they couldn't figure out the reason for it. After doing intensive research, my parents learned that this was a genetic disorder, and unfortunately, there was no treatment for it. They still had lengthy conversations with experts on the subject. As a result of those conversations, they understood that the only cure for it was time. According to the doctors, there was a high probability that I would develop diabetes, hypertension, or cancer, diseases that are common among older people. However, if I could manage to stay alive, I'd go through a reverse aging process. What does reverse aging mean? Normally, people get a little older with each passing day. But the opposite would happen to me. I'd be getting younger every day. Finding out about this gave my parents hope. They would do their best to keep me alive as long as possible and allow me to get younger this way. And luckily, they've been able to do this successfully up until now. As you may have guessed, I had a very difficult childhood. I don't just mean all the health issues I had to deal with. I got used to them with time. What really upset me was other kids staying away from me. There are a lot of things I can't forget. For example, there was the time my mom and I went to the mall. I was only five years old then, but I looked like someone who was 70. My mom took me to the children's play area at the mall. There was a ball pit with two girls in it. They were throwing balls, having fun. At first, they didn't notice me. So I climbed inside, picked up a ball, and threw it their way. When they finally saw me, they suddenly screamed and left the ball pit crying. I was so young, I couldn't possibly understand why I scared them away. Of course, now I don't blame them. Imagine this. I was their height, I acted just like them, but I looked like their grandmother. It was so normal to be scared of someone like that. But since I didn't know about my condition, it upset me so much that all the kids were running away from me and I didn't have any friends because of the way I looked. As I was getting older, I was starting to look younger, but I still looked like a 60-year-old woman when I was 10. All of my hair was still white as snow. Thankfully, the wrinkles on my face and my hands were disappearing day by day. Most importantly, I didn't have as many health issues. To start looking normal, all I had to do was to survive, because every morning I was waking up as someone younger and younger. Also by this time, my friends had accepted me for who I was. 
So I was in a much better place emotionally too. Sure, there were the occasional losers whose idea of having fun was making fun of me. At school, there was one group of boys who were obsessed with me. They would find a way to bother me every chance they got. For example, when I was chatting with someone, they'd come up and say, Say what again? Speak louder, I can't hear you, mimicking an elderly person. Or they would mock me by pointing to the apple in front of me at the cafeteria and saying things like, Do you have teeth? Can you eat that apple? I wasn't saying anything back because all they wanted was for me to react. I decided there was no point in getting upset by them. After a while, when my friends began warning them, they finally knocked it off. Last year at school, something funny happened. A younger girl came up to me. First, she apologized for disturbing me. Then she said, Our history teacher gave us homework about World War II. Where were you during the war? What do you remember? Can I interview you for my assignment? You get it, right? The girl thought I was old for real. In the beginning, I thought she was making fun of me. But when I saw she was actually serious, I burst out laughing. <laughs> you might have calculated from what I've told you so far that every five years, I get 10 years younger. That means I will look 40 when I am, in fact, 20. When I turn 25, I will look 30. And at 30, I will look like a 20-year-old young girl. Sounds pretty good so far. I can't wait for those days to arrive. But what's going to happen after? That's what really scares me. If it keeps going like this, when I'm 35, I'll look like a 15-year-old. At 40, I'll look 10. And at 45, I'll look like a 5-year-old kid. Everything will be reversed. I mean, my peers will start to shun me because I will look the same age as their kids. Of course, even though physically I will look like a kid, mentally I'll still be an adult. Maybe because of this, they will keep treating me normally, as they would a 40-year-old. It looks like I'll have really interesting problems in my life as I get older. For example, I want to go to medical school and become a doctor like my parents. Think about it. You make an appointment at the hospital. When you enter the room, you see an eight-year-old kid wearing a white lab coat. When I say to patients, hello, tell me what's bothering you, I don't think they'll start talking to me as if everything were normal. Now that I think about it, I guess being a doctor is not the best career choice for someone like me. Another issue I'll have in the future is related to having kids. Now just imagine for a moment that you are my child. Your mother looks like a little girl, although she talks and acts like a normal adult. How would you react to that? I can't even imagine it. Do you think my kid will take me seriously when I say, do your homework, finish your dinner, or enough video games for today? How will he handle my getting younger as he gets older? Will he like having a mom that looks the same age as him, or will it be bothering him? And the real question is what happens once I turn 50? According to the calculations, I will look like a baby when I am that age. In reality, we have no idea what's going to happen because nobody with my condition has ever lived that long. However, because I'm quite healthy, there's a good chance that I will live to 50. I wonder what will happen. I'm so curious. For example, will I lose my ability to walk because I will have the physical features of a baby? And also, since babies don't talk, will I have to learn how to talk all over again? There are hundreds of questions to which nobody knows the answers yet. I can only answer them by staying alive. There's actually a movie that talks about my condition, although it's old, so you might not have seen it. It's called The Curious Case of Benjamin Button. Brad Pitt plays the main character. The protagonist of the movie is born as an older person and gets younger as time goes by, just like me. It's a wonderful movie. I highly recommend it. It might help you to better understand people who have my condition. But I didn't like the ending because once the guy, I mean Brad Pitt, starts looking like a child, his mental age goes back to a child's level as well. He forgets everything he lived through, everything he learned. He even forgets how to write. He starts behaving just like a child. His friends end up treating him as a kid. But I think they wrote it this way simply for the script to make sense. I don't think in the future my mental capacity will go down to a child's level. If that had been the case, I would have started talking the day I was born. I think physically I will look like I'm five, but mentally I'll be 45 or 50 years old. Of course, that's my assumption. What do you think could happen? Please write your thoughts in the comments. Thank you for listening to me. You can subscribe to this channel now if you want to be notified when new videos are uploaded. And if you like my story, please don't forget to like this video. Goodbye. Hi friends, I'm Constance. I'm 15 years old. 
Two years ago, a billionaire family adopted me. That's how I got this life I couldn't even imagine having. Now I'm going to tell you all about it, both the good and the bad parts. I'm sure you'll find my story interesting. Please don't forget to like the video. My dad left us when I was a baby. My mom used to tell me all the time that he wasn't a good person and we were better off without him. But I still grew up imagining greeting my father at the door when he came home from work at the end of the day and receiving a huge, <laughs> loving hug from him. My mom didn't have a profession. She'd work any job she could get. When she got sick, she was unemployed for a long time. Because she couldn't take care of me, she left me at a group home when I was nine. But every week, she would come and visit me. She used to say, when I'm doing better, I'll get us a nice house. We'll live together again. But she lived on the street, and us having a life together seemed like a very remote possibility. The next year, my mom stopped visiting me. I got worried because that wasn't normal. I asked for help from the social workers at the home. I found out that my mom was hospitalized because her health was deteriorating. After a while, when I heard that she had died, I was devastated. Even though I was very young, I was aware that my mom had lost her life to poverty. They took good care of us at the home, but we all wanted to get adopted, to have a family. Kids who would fit their criteria would be recommended to prospective adoptive families by the management of the home. The families would look at their options, meet the kids, and then make their decision. Families usually preferred kids aged four to five. Kids at age were easier to look after because they weren't babies anymore, and they were still young enough to be raised by the family as they wished. I, on the other hand, was 13 years old. Because I hit puberty, my prospects of being adopted had further diminished. In fact, they were almost non-existent. One day, the director of the home called me. She said I fit this one family's criteria, and she wanted to introduce me to them. This family had an eight-year-old son. They didn't have any other children. They were worried that their son would be all alone in the future. They wanted an older sister who could support him and decided to adopt a girl my age. This was a huge surprise for me. They were about to walk into the director's office. As I was waiting for them, I was so excited that my feet were shaking. Thankfully, our first meeting went great. They told me they really liked me and they could definitely see me as a wonderful older sister for their son. When the director said, Constance, gather your belongings and say goodbye to your friends. Your new family lives in another city. They will be leaving with you today. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. Finally, I would have a family too. There were three luxury cars waiting for us in front of the home. We got into the one in the front. The other two followed us. This was going to be my first plane ride. I'd seen the airport only in the movies. I told my new mom, are we going to buy a ticket for me from the airport? And she smiled. <laughs> you don't need a ticket, honey, she said. I figured out what she meant by that when we arrived at the airport. My new family had their own private plane. I, of course, didn't yet know that they were billionaires. Their fortune came from gold and silver mines in different spots around the world. I could only dream of such a rich family adopting me, but thankfully this wasn't a dream. The director at the home had said we were going to another city, but the plane landed not in a city, but on an island. This island in the middle of the ocean, of course, belonged to them. There was just this one house on the whole island. It was the biggest building I'd ever seen. I didn't even know they were called mansions. There was a ship docked on the shore. Do I need to tell you? That too belonged to my new family. Soon, I would find out it wasn't called a ship, but a yacht. I wasn't aware of it yet, but I'd started living the life of a billionaire. This is where I met my brother, Parker. He didn't seem like an eight-year-old at all. He was dressed exactly like an adult. I was going to be his sister from now on. I made a move to give him a hug, but Parker held himself back and offered his hand coldly. I shook his hand, saying, Hi, Parker, I'm Constance. Parker looked at his mom with a displeased look on his face. Constance? Apparently, he didn't like my name. His mom, I mean my new mom, turned to me and said, Darling, people have more modern names in our social circle. Rather than Constance, shall we call you Jasmine from now? I knew my name was old-fashioned, but it was my mom who had given it to me. Still, I couldn't say anything. Hmm. I just nodded. <laughs> there was a large number of staff in the house. Cooks, drivers, butlers, maids. In addition to all this, they told me I had a personal maid, too. This person came and said, let me show you to your room. She was a girl four or five years older than me. Her name's Mary Jane. When she led me to my room, I couldn't believe my eyes. Even this room was screaming, this is a billionaire's house. There was a bed five people could sleep in. There were armchairs around, paintings on the walls. 
I was a 13-year-old girl, but this room looked more like it belonged to the Queen of England. I wanted to get some information on my new family from Mary Jane. She was hesitant at first, but then she started talking to me when we became friendly. The family spends a few months every summer on the island. Because my new mom doesn't like staying in hotels, they have houses in many cities, each one more luxurious than the other. The yacht I saw on the dock is the smallest they have. The one they most frequently use is at least three times bigger than this one. Every time Mary Jane said something, I kept blurting out, Really? She smiled and replied, really. I learned such fantastic things in that conversation, and I probably said really at least 20 times. The next day, something strange happened. There was a screening room in the house. Parker and I were watching a movie there. Mary Jane came and told me my new dad was waiting for me in his study. When I went in, he was with another man in a suit. My new dad said, Welcome to our family, my dear. Let me introduce you to our attorney, Mr. Owens. We have a couple of legal matters we need to take care of. When the attorney said, Jasmine, I drew up some contracts regarding certain matters. I'm asking you to read and sign them, please. I was really surprised. After this, the attorney gave me the documents one by one and told me what each one was about. This document is for the name change. We'll file a petition and your name will be changed to Jasmine. This document is an agreement about inheritance. In the future, you will be a part of the will, but your inheritance will be smaller compared to Parker's. This contract is about social media usage. You're prohibited from opening TikTok or Instagram accounts and sharing information about the family in any other way. Finally, this contract is for your allowance. Every month, you will be given an allowance of this amount written here. You will not be able to demand more than that. After telling me all this, the attorney offered me a pen and said, please sign under every agreement. I didn't like this one bit, but I wasn't in a position to argue. I had to sign them all. We stayed on the island for about a month. It was nowhere near the life I dreamed of. Parker and my new dad were distant to me. My new mom would talk to me now and then, but it was more in the lines of, how are things with Parker? What kind of things are you doing together? Unfortunately, my replies were not the kinds of things she would want to hear. I wanted to be closer to my new brother, but it wasn't possible because Parker had built this really high wall between us. My new dad had some work to do. So one morning, our private jet arrived on the island and took us to London. After a while, we went to Tokyo. We stayed there for only three days. Then we flew to the city where the family actually lived. We were always traveling on our private plane and staying in our own homes, whichever city we went to. When I was younger, I wanted to travel to different countries. But these trips were not at all like what I imagined them to be. Because of security reasons, we almost never went out. When you are inside a house, it doesn't really matter if you're in London or Tokyo. Two and a half years ago, the Mafia attempted to kidnap Parker. Thankfully, bodyguards stopped them. The kidnappers confessed that they tried to take Parker and asked for a ransom of $50 million. After that incident, security measures were enhanced. It was deemed dangerous for Parker to go to school and decided that he should be homeschooled with private tutors. Now that I was their daughter, the same security measures applied to me. I was devastated when I found out about this. I was feeling incredibly lonely. I was looking forward to starting school, making new friends. If I was homeschooled, then the only kid around me would be Parker, and he did not like me at all. I'd always wanted to get adopted, to have a family, but this was definitely not what I had dreamed of. At first, I loved that my new family was very rich. But then I saw that everything was good in moderation, and that included having an excessive amount of money. I think Parker wasn't happy with his life either, but he wasn't admitting it. My new mom went to another city on a business trip. I thought about going back to the group home without telling her, but then I thought that wouldn't be right. I waited for her. When she came back, I went to speak with her. I told her Parker didn't feel the need for a sister and he would never accept me as one. She thought I was right. You're right, honey. Unfortunately, this was an unsuccessful attempt. You're free to do what you want to do. I told her I wanted to go back to the group home, but she suggested something else that changed my life in an instant. I was going to go to a private boarding school. They would obviously cover all my expenses. After high school, if I decided to go to college, they would give me a scholarship. Right now, I'm at a wonderful private school in Switzerland. Since it's a very expensive boarding school, the families of the kids here are pretty rich. But as far as I knew, there are no billionaires among them. Meanwhile, my new mom gives me a call now and then and insists that I spend my summer vacation with them. Even Parker called me once and invited me. I think I'm going to spend the summer on the island. If anything interesting happens, I'll definitely let you know. Goodbye for now. <laughs>
Hello, my name is Marie. I am 13 years old. That's already typical for me. 12 is still quite childish. 14, on the other hand, is already clearly adolescent. 13 is actually nothing. I am not blonde. I am not brunette. I'm not particularly smart or funny. Nothing about me is special. I am a boring gray mouse. Everyone in my family has something that stands out. My father is a jock and runs marathon after marathon. My mother is a very popular doctor who is constantly approached by patients. Even my little brother with his cheeky charm and quick wit stands out immediately. Only I am just boring and mediocre. I only noticed this when my best friend Leah went to Canada as an exchange student. Leah lives just two houses away from me. We've been friends ever since I can remember. Going to school together every day and sitting next to each other there from the first day of school. My crisis started when Leah went to Canada without me. I really wanted to go, but my parents just wouldn't allow it. I have no idea if Leah is special to others. To me, she definitely is. She is the kindest person I know. Together with her, I never felt so bad, so insignificant. Suddenly, the seat next to me on the bus and at school was empty, and I was just gray. Even when I looked in the mirror. I did not know what to do with myself. The movies I usually watched with Leah didn't interest me on my own. When I went to the movies or ice skating with the others, I felt superfluous. Often I thought they wouldn't miss me if I wasn't there. Or maybe they wouldn't even notice. The longer I thought about it, the more convinced I became that I was just a nobody in my class. Everyone else has something special. Alex, for example, he's so funny, always making everyone laugh. He can really think of a joke in any situation, even when he's gotten a bad grade. He's always in a good mood. Or Clara, who seems as fragile and delicate as an elf. Of course, she dances ballet and moves as if she were floating. The boys blush just looking at her. Everyone notices immediately when she doesn't come to school one day. And they all scramble to send her the homework. Very different from what happened to me last week. I was sick and no one thought to send me the homework. So I called Sophie, who sits two rows ahead of me about the homework. Surprised, she asked me, weren't you there today? She just hadn't noticed, and most of the others probably hadn't either. I wondered if I could be as cool as Ben. A cool outfit and speaking a maximum of three words at a time, I should be able to do that, I thought. Most of the time, he says things like, is that so? Not mine. Or running. In the end, though, I realized that I wouldn't dare enter the classroom dressed so conspicuously. I thought that if I studied day and night, maybe I could become as smart as Eric. He just knows everything. When the whole class groans in chemistry, he really warms up. In statistics, he's the only one who volunteers. And he probably knows all the rivers, cities, and mountains in the world. After two weeks of cramming, I had rings under my eyes. I realized that I would never manage to become as smart as Eric. Next, I asked myself, what would I have to do to become a girl as extraordinary as Alessia? Her big dark eyes look so mysterious. On top of that, she just has style. It seems innate to her. She never has lint on her shirt or a torn fingernail. Not even after art class does she have paint on her hands. I quickly had to admit to myself, whatever I do, I'll never be able to be like that. Just before vacation, my aunt came to watch me and my little brother. My parents were going to a medical conference that weekend. My aunt said that gradually I could make something of myself. Since I didn't protest energetically, she started with a makeover, as she called it. She parted my hair straight, blow-dried my hair, and put makeup on me. When she was done, she said, now you may look in the mirror. I was horrified and hardly recognized myself. There was no way I would have gone to school looking like that. I looked like my own teacher. Then I went on vacation to a summer camp for the first time without my best friend Leah. 
Since no one knew me there, I had made a plan. I wanted to stand out there and not get lost. To do this, I got myself a pair of sunglasses and a few other things to spice up my outfit. I was determined to be really cool and a bit mysterious, at least at camp. For that, I practiced in front of the mirror at home and memorized a few of Ben's sayings. It was hell. No one thought I was cool or mysterious. I think they just thought I was dumb and stuck up. Ben's sayings like, who cares, or works for you, got me weird looks at best and no one felt like doing anything with me. I was the last one picked for a team at sports and no one sat down next to me at dinner. It only got better when, after a week, I meekly dropped the sunglasses and the sayings. Still, they just didn't really trust me anymore. That was definitely the worst summer camp of my life. When school started again after the vacations, Max from my parallel class sat next to me on the bus. Probably because the seat next to me was the only free one on the bus. He asked where my girlfriend was, and we talked about our parents, siblings, and friends, and what special guys they all were. After that, we sat on the bus together every day, and I felt a tiny bit less lonely and gray. I wondered if Max had something special. He wasn't as smart as Eric, not as funny as Alex, not as cool as Ben, and not as interesting and mysterious as Alessia. But he was kind of nice. I still spent a lot of time alone, but I wasn't doing quite as badly anymore. When I did something with some of my class, I still thought they were just more interesting than me. But I wasn't as distant from them anymore. After all, they couldn't help it if everything about me was just mediocre. I missed Leah. I couldn't talk to anyone about how I felt. Not even with her when we talked on the phone from time to time. She was simply too far away for that. My mother asked me once again what was wrong with me. I couldn't and wouldn't tell her anything about my thoughts. She thought I missed Leah, and that was true. I let her believe that was the only reason for my bad mood. How could she, of all people, understand what I was missing? She was always someone exceptionally smart, kind, and athletic, even as a child. To comfort me, she told me that it would only be 10 days until Leah would be back. Then finally, Leah came back from Canada, called me and asked what was going on with me and why I had been so out of touch. She came over and I told her about my crisis and how I just can't see anything special about myself and feel terrible. <sighs> Leah explained to me how much she likes me and how often loud Alex and sensitive Clara get on her nerves. She said, you are the only person with whom I can talk completely normally about everything. You don't constantly push yourself to the fore. With you, not everything has to be cool or funny. You're my best friend because of who you are. I immediately felt better and wanted to know everything about her time in Canada. The next time Max and I were alone together on the bus, because Leah was at the doctor, I told him about my conversation with Leah. He laughed and said that he felt that way quite often and how he sometimes feels next to guys who are super athletic, incredibly funny, or cool, that he'd much rather be with people who are more like him. Like you, he said. And it's just easier to talk to you. Not just endless conversations about sports or just making <sighs> cool comments like I do with some of my class. By now, Leah, Max, and I, all three of us are good friends. We still talked a lot about being special and what we'll probably be like when we grow up. We do a lot together and encourage each other to do something unusual sometimes. But every time we ask ourselves if we really want to do it, or if we just hope it will make us special. Sometimes we go out for ice cream and keep an eye out for special people. We agree on one thing. It must be quite exhausting to be so special all the time.